welcome everybody to LinkedIn Local PDX. Uh, and we're going to have uh, Brian speaking this evening. But before we get going, I just want to let um, Eric, who's my, uh, my co-host and, and partner with LinkedIn Local PDX, and me uh, introduce ourselves. And then we'll read the land acknowledgement and have Brian introduce himself. And if nobody else logs in, we could quickly have each of you introduce yourselves. But if a lot of people start piling in, sometimes it, it's better with chat and then we have uh, the networking connecting time afterward. So Eric, uh, do you wanna go ahead and say who you are and, and then I'll do it and then um, we'll see who else comes in. Yeah, hi everyone, my name is Eric and uh, I'm, uh, I just love entrepreneurship and been helping Kim with this group for a while now and I've coordinated and with a few things with Brian as well. I've got a little company called Bridge City Media and I'm really excited about uh, this topic tonight. And I'm Kim. I co-founded LinkedIn Local PDX at the beginning of 20, I forget it was 18 or 19 now. We, we've been around for a while and love having everybody join us. Thanks so much. And I uh, work locally at the SBDC. I'm a program advisor there. And actually, Brian and um, Heather are a couple of alum from that particular program, and Juliana as well. And uh, I'm also a local real estate agent and a business owner who supports impact companies and social enterprises. So I think I don't see anybody else. So I'll let uh, Brian, I'll let you introduce yourself right before you start talking, but I'm going to go ahead and read the land acknowledgement. Uh, so welcome, and this is a great place to be present, open, engaged, respectful, and have a lot of fun. Uh, under all is the land, and we would like to offer our land acknowledgement and thank the PSU Native American Student and Community Center and Anti-Racism Daily and NativeMovement.org and Open Stage for sharing us the verb with us the verbiage for the land acknowledgement. Tonight we honor those indi indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on. The Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala bands of the Chinook, the Tualat and Kulapaya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering their communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. We also acknowledge this not only in thanks to the indigenous communities who have held relations with this land for generations, but also in recognition of the historical and ongoing legacy of colonialism. Additionally, we acknowledge this as a point of reflection for all of us who work toward dismantling colonial practices. We also acknowledge that systems of oppression have taken land from black and brown and marginalized families and communities as recently as the last and current century. And we commit to the work of dismantling ongoing legacies of systemic racism. So thank you. And if you're ever interested, sometimes it's just interesting to Google where you are, like down to the zip code, down to the street, down to the town, and see who the tribal nations were that were on that land that we now we now have settled upon. So thank you all for being here. I'm gonna hand it over to Brian, who is amazing for a really interesting, engaging time. And just thank you, thanks for your attention. And, and I'm gonna hand it over. Yeah, I appreciate that, Kim. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us on your Monday evening. I'm really excited about this talk. We're gonna be talking about building your story brand. So I'm gonna pull up my slides here so everyone can see. And yeah, I want to say a big thank you to LinkedIn Local for giving me the opportunity to speak and as well to Bridge City Media and Eric Croswell for putting this together and Kim, you guys are awesome uh, putting together this group and helping entrepreneurs, helping the PDX community thrive and as well just giving back, which is I think what we're all here to do, kind of give back educationally and you know, build a community. So um, building your story brand on LinkedIn, social and web. This is when I was putting together these slides, I was a little intimidated because it's on a bunch of different platforms that have their own needs, you know, looks and wants. So it's um, quite the challenge, but I'm going to do my best for you guys. At the very core, we'll be talking about story foundationally, how you can implement this into your own business and maybe into your own personal brand. And we'll dive 
into uh, social and have some examples along the way. So very right off the bat, um, this the story brand concept or idea has become more popular because of Donald Miller. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with his book, but it's called Building a Story Brand. And I remember this becoming really popular with a lot of the professionals I was working with. People would reference it. And I actually did a podcast episode to get my own mind wrapped around it. And so if you go to my podcast, it's called the Vidmark Podcast. I've had uh, Kim and Eric on there. So you're welcome to check out their episodes as well. But um, episode 21 is the one where I talk a little bit deeper into building the story brand. Um, but and this that's just to give you a little bit more extra context beyond, um, you know, what you might be learning here in this presentation. But essentially, uh, what a story is, um, actually, I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, I'll talk a little bit about myself. So uh, you guys are probably wondering, uh, you know, who is this guy? Um, you know, why am I talking about this? Well, I've been making videos. So my background is in video storytelling, video content creation. And I've been doing it since about 2007, when I was back in high school, picked up my first camera, just made some goofy videos with my friends that eventually grew into a love for storytelling and using all the great things that you have access to with video, which is the audio, music, um, and then the visuals and trying to sequence things in a way that's captivating and keeps people engaged and excited um, about the content. So I've been doing it since 08. I've created about 800 videos. It's been a lot, uh, all different types from webinar type videos to music videos to a little bit more corporate side of videos and commercial storytelling. Um, you know, different, different ways. So there's, there's a lot of different um, types of videos, but we're going to break down in this speech, just like the, the common ways to tell a good story. So my background is from journalism, which I call it more of a, like a, a storytelling degree, which allowed me that taught me how to ask really thoughtful questions and tell a very authentic story, which sometimes we don't always get in uh, in the media and things like that. So, but you can do that as a brand, as an individual, you can represent yourself very well and you can um, tell a better picture and, um, you know, connect with people on a more of an emotional level. Um, so then I, you know, graduated, worked for a financial services company for four years, continuing to make those videos, I actually made 500 for them. And then within the last two years, I started my own company called Tactus Media, uh, Media Tactics That Stick, thanks to Kim and her program at S SBDC. It got me excited to make that transition from just having it be my own name to having my own company, which has been very exciting. And then as a extra supplement to be able to help educate and inspire people with video production, I've created a podcast called the Vidmark Podcast, and that's the logo up there in the corner. So in this um, presentation, we're going to break down these five elements. So why story matters, how to craft a good story, the tools and resources available to you, and then the dreaded, what are some things to avoid and what are their pitfalls? And then I'll open it up for Q&A. So if you have any questions along the way, I'll try to answer those because with this presentation, I'm going to be kind of talking in general terms about stories. So you might have a question that's very specific to your industry or what you're trying to accomplish right now. And I'm happy to answer those at the end. All right. So why does story matter? What is the, the benefit of story? Well, psychologically, we think and we navigate the world using stories. So for example, you know, you can think of like the a movie that has stood out for you. What is able to captivate you for two and a half to three hours? Well, it's story. Because most of the time we have all these other distractions. You could go on your phone, you could read a book, you could do whatever else. But a movie is able to keep your attention for that amount of time. And then when you think of, um, you know, not to get biblical or anything, but the Bible is written in stories. So that way it sticks in people's minds. So you could be no different with your brand. You can create a story that sticks in the mind of your customers. And we actually place a lot of value on stories. Um, one of the best examples I've heard of is, so if you were selling a desk, you know, just any old desk, it may be, you know, worth whatever the value of the desk is. Now, if I add a story to it, say it belonged to 
you know, one of the, the founding fathers, you know, George Washington, say it was George Washington's desk. Now all of a sudden that value goes through the roof. So you can do something similar with your own brand and your own organization and uh, create a story that explains who you are and elevates your value essentially. And we'll break that down in the next few slides. As well with, you know, bringing things back to the Donald Miller uh, story brand, he says that what you should do is be empathetic to your audience. And what a lot of people, what a lot of brands or companies think is that they are the hero, that you're the one that is going to save the day. And essentially, that's not, that's kind of a backwards way of looking at things. Pretty much that book in a nutshell is saying that you're, the hero is your customer. So what you are to them is a guide that's showing them along the way, they're reaching out to you and you're helping solve that problem and you're with them for this journey alongside them. And so whenever you're creating your story, keep in mind that your customer, your audience, they're seeing themselves as the hero, not you. So that's a, a good way of kind of piecing together your content. As well, stories are easier to share. It's a lot easier to talk about a product or a service out there in a story format, it, you know, a common gossip, like gossip in a nutshell is just sharing a story that you heard about somebody. And that's why it's so powerful and why we, why people do it knowingly or unknowingly. As well, um, if you don't have a story, you're probably not standing out. And from all the marketing books that I've read, if you're not standing out, then you're invisible. And if you're invisible, then you're going to have a hard time getting customers. And well, I'm going to take a, a sip of water here. Yeah, as well, um, you know, I think a lot of you have probably heard that uh, facts tell, but stories sell. And I know uh, I've been critiqued in the past for not having as many stats. So I've put all of my stats on this one slide just to you know, give you guys an idea. But these three here I thought were pretty impactful for um, just thinking about the impact that story can have for you. 92% of customers want brands to make ads feel like a story because um, it resonates with you. It's a more exciting, more engaging to walk, watch a story. At the end of the day, a Super Bowl ad is just a miniature story that has been compressed into 30 seconds and trying to keep your attention throughout. They uh, did a class survey on market smiths and they found that 5% of people remember a statistic. So 95% of you aren't even going to remember any of these stats, uh, but you'll remember the stories throughout. And then, yeah, 63 were actually able to recall the stories that were told in a presentation. And they're 22 times more memorable. I don't know how they measure this, but uh, if you guys want, you can check out those websites and get a little bit more follow up. But this is just me explaining the benefits of a story. So we've talked about, you know, what what a story can do for you. But now I'd like to dive a little deeper into what is a story? What are some of the foundational nuts and bolts that make a good story? And this diagram is taken from the hero's journey. So if you, many of you might, might be familiar with Joseph Campbell, who came up with this idea and really revolutionized it or popularized this idea. And I brought uh, actually this book, the very first story that's ever been kind of characterized and that's Gilgamesh and that goes through all these stages in the hero story where and you know call to adventure you have a mentor you have a guide that helps you along the way you have some kind of transformation going through a hardship and then you get rewarded and you have a new kind of way of looking at life now I don't dive into each of these these each could be dove into much deeper but I chose to just go surface level um because you don't need to know all these aspects of story and this can get, kind of get overwhelming. So what I've done is broken it down into just three components. So when you're creating content for social media or you're putting something on your website, all of your pieces of content should have some kind of element of these three things is one, a promise. So you're explaining to your audience, hey, this is what you're gonna be getting out of following along for reading through all this text. I promise you that I'm going to reveal some kind of, uh, you know, maybe it's a question, you reveal the answer to it. Uh, if you look to the right here, you'll see the JJ Abrams TED Talk, which I put the link down at the bottom. But if you go and uh, go to TED Talks on YouTube, you'll see JJ Abrams, the mystery box. And he's famous for the TV show Lost. He just recently did the Star Wars series. And 
his concept is the idea of the mystery box is what keeps people going. So at the very beginning of the movie, you show some kind of mystery. And then at the end, you're going to reveal it, but they're going to have to go through a series of different stages and events before they do the big reveal. And that's the journey. And then the third part being the revelation. Now, the fourth thing that's not in here at the end of a movie, they don't say, hey, go sign up for my email newsletter or share this post. But due to social media, you'll want to have people take an action at the end of it. So whether that's liking the post or like I just said, signing up for an email newsletter or maybe purchasing an item. And if they can't do any of those, at the very least, maybe they're willing to share it. And you would think that people... It's been said so many times, hey, subscribe to my YouTube channel or subscribe to my podcast that people say that, but you do really do need to remind people what that step is. And I recommend just limiting to one action. If you have all these different types of actions, people are less likely to take them. So yeah, those are kind of those three in the nutshell. I would say definitely go check out that JJ Abrams mystery box TED talk if you get the chance. So you, He's been on the cutting edge of a lot of big stories that we know. So here are some of the key stories for your business. I made a, if you look over to the right side, I made a little PowerPoint uh, slide that you can download. If you just email me, I can send that to you, but that's in relation to video. So those are all the different types of video content you can make, but it's no different, you know, video versus the blog versus a podcast. Um, you should be answering some of these questions or revealing some of these stories for your audience. The number one story that many people have or, you know, question that they might have your business is the origin story. You know, where did you come from? Uh, who are you and why are you running your business? I think of some of the iconic stories. There's the one of Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, uh, driving cross country and writing his business plan in the back of his car while his wife was driving just before doing a presentation. Um, you know, you think of the stories of uh, Nike here in the Portland backyard. It started with, we all know the, the waffle irons idea of doing the press. And so all of these stories get kind of uh, shared and thought about with your organization. So these are some things to just take in consideration. When did you start your company? You know, maybe a little bit of context of who you are, what was the problem that you solve and how you overcame that. And you can tell this in blog post form. You can tell this through your podcast or you can create a video. Um, and I'll dive into maybe the, the video aspect a little bit further on. The second kind of story that you can create for your business are what well, we talked about earlier with Donald Miller, putting your audience, your customers as the centralized hero. So do you have a success story where someone else that's uh, watching or reading your content can say, oh, I can see myself as that hero of the story, uh, just like someone else that had a su successful moment. Um, and so you can replicate that. Testimonials. You know, I come from the video world. So interviewing somebody that had a good experience and saying, why was it a good experience and why was it different? could be very profound, as well as how-to how content. So this is kind of reflecting this uh, handout over here. Um, yeah, and so then the third one is culture. So the, another story that you can tell are what are the causes and things that you care about and sharing that with your audience and getting them on the same page because we, we buy from businesses that align with their own core values. So um, yeah, maybe there's an event that you're helping put on this year, or there's something, a cause that you want to shed light on, that's the time to do it and tell those stories through your different uh, social media platforms, as well as showing your personality. So a story can really encapsulate and highlight um, what makes you unique. All right, I'm going to try to slow down a little bit. I know I'm uh, probably flying through these and talking really fast. That's one of my, one of the things I have to work on as a speaker, but yeah, I'm excited. These are, so I've made a series of case studies that, to break down some really good uses of story and uh, for different organizations. So the first one is Dove. Dove has a really fascinating uh, backstory of campaign. So beyond just the what I have here, doing your own research and looking at Dove, they, it can be really inspiring. But you can see that the, the three content pieces that I have highlighted below stem from their mission statement. So at Dove, we have a vision of a world where beauty is a source of confidence, not anxiety. 
Our mission is to ensure the next generation grow up enjoying a positive relationship with the way they look, helping girls to raise their self-esteem and realize their full potential. Um, now, they're no different than a lot of other brands when I was looking them up. They have their controversial things that they've put out there that haven't landed as well, and they've apologized. And But here are some things that they've done recently that have done really well. So uh, with the pandemic, with uh, COVID-19, they highlighted International Nurses Day and highlighted when people um, pull down their mask and what they look like. So um, that's something that you can do for your own brand. Is there an annual holiday that you can tell stories around, really depending on what industry you're in. For example, here's healthcare. So highlighting nurses day, maybe you're in construction, there's like safety awareness day or agriculture. I'm pretty sure uh, there's some days there. Uh, maybe you're in retail, but really getting creative. And um, this is something that you can build upon annually. Dove's been doing this for a few years now, so it makes it easier, but um, maybe there's one thing that you can highlight every year, build upon it. Can you outdo what you did in the previous years with your and make sure that you, you know, you're highlighting and encapsulating those stories along the way. The next one is I wanted to take a look at their Instagram look. Uh, I think a lot of the slides here will be kind of geared towards Instagram, but you'll notice that they have a little bit of their branding and all of their uh, posts. You can either you can see the little dove icon, or you can see their logo where there. I mean the text. Um, but th hopefully, this is just some inspiration for you. And so, what are they doing? They're doing those three things. They're creating intrigue. So right away, you're like, oh, I want to click on that. And then the the promise is, what is this about? And you're re they're revealing that through the text, or maybe they're sending you to a a greater web page that'll explain it more in detail. Then the next thing that you can do as a brand is you can help retell the stories of other companies. So what Dove did is they saw that Netflix was doing a good job of highlighting International Women's Day, and they re retweeted it with their own comments and their own text. And that's something that you can do as well. So that's Dove. They're doing a pretty good job. The next case study is Depop. Now, this might resonate with a few more of you. They are a clothing brand. And so if you're in the retail space or you're selling something that's fun and uh, has personality, um, they're a good example. And what they say that they do is they actually just, they repost the best stuff is what they've said at the end of the day. And, um, you know, that's a good mantra for all of our companies is the, you know, what is the best stuff that you can highlight? Now, best is subjective and not easy to do, but it also means just kind of filtering through things that may not resonate as well or might not be as catchy. So bringing the, letting the, uh, the, the cream rise to the top as, as, a, <laughs> as an old school saying, as I can use, um, you know, that's a good way of, you know, highlighting the things that are going to make you stand out. And then they say they do a little bit of influencer marketing and they do a little bit of paid marketing. But at the end of the day, they're just trying to get the best stuff out there. I took a screenshot of their Instagram. Everything on this Instagram page makes me want to click on it and say, hey, what, what is this about? Tell me more. So the intrigue factor is there. Um, I don't have any examples of clicking in there, but I, I imagine that they would kind of answer that call. The next one is engagement. So what they've done is they do a good job of actually making it feel very consumer friendly and asking direct questions to their audience and maybe keeping it simple and not always having to just talk about whatever your brand is, but have some personality to it. Uh, like this one was fun. Your random reminder that Depop is pronounced Depop. You know, that's something that you can do for your company, especially if your company kind of might have a, a name that's more harder to pronounce or isn't as uh, you know, straightforward. And Reflected, uh, you know, they have their website, which is eye-catching right away. They have good photos, and their text is simple, straight to the point, and then they've reinforced with their logo. The next case study, which is a little bit more of a fun one, Chipotle. You know, these are all things that you can do, and I'm going to I'll break down. So I've used some bigger companies as a reference, but that's just as inspiration, but I'll break down what you can do individually. And then on a, a tighter budget to be able to do some things on a similar scale to you know, create some cultural pieces that stand out. But Chipotle, they really invested into their digital sales and they saw a revenue growth of 14.6, which equated to 1.4 billion for them when they 
put a new focus on social media. And what's really fun about Chipotle is they've created a personality behind all of their ingredients. And this is a screen grab from a TikTok where someone had taken all of the ingredients and compared them to um, people's signs, their astronomy, astrological signs, which was really fun. And then another thing that Chipotle has done is they've combined two really fun elements, a song, a, an individually produced song, and then uh, this woman here dancing to the guacamole song. So that's something that we could all do. Like, you know, maybe you have a product or a service, and you could, and you're doing an announcement, you could do a fun singing song around it. And, you know, it it could be somewhat embarrassing, but it also humanizes you and sh shows that you don't take yourself so seriously. You know, especially for Chipotle, they're not this corporate, you know, entity brand. They want everyone to enjoy uh, their burritos and uh, their rice bowls and so i took a screenshot of their screenshot of their instagram as well and you'll see that theirs isn't as you know clean as dove where there's there's a little logo or dove icon and everything but it's uh i don't know more it resonates and it's uh i don't know trying to be more simple try to I don't know, be like us, be like the consumer. So that's something to keep in mind too. Depending on what your brand is, how uh, I don't know, strict you want to be with the branding or how loose you want to be with uh, creating content that's just going to resonate with people. Are you a fun kind of brand? Are you odd? Are you trying to be different, trying to stand out? Those are all the things to keep in mind. Now let's really break down um, you know, how this relates to you because you're not a Dove or Chipotle yet. Maybe we have someone that's a, the CEO in there, but I haven't seen. Um, but yeah, so advertising, when you're creating pieces of content, it's you need to be socially conscious. So have a pulse on what's happening in the world. Um, you know, what, how will your content be received? Really be empathetic to uh, the people that are going to be scrolling through and looking at your content. Ask yourself that question, um, you know, could this offend somebody potentially? Could uh, this not resonate? Could this, you know, just really be thoughtful? Now, this slide, this presentation isn't a, about this, but when you do make a goof or you, you mess up, being quick to apologize, being quick to acknowledge and own up, and um, you know, that's a kind of a good mantra that I think everyone could benefit from. Uh, how to compete? when it comes to creating you know a really high-end commercial for a super bowl commercial well you don't that's a, essentially you need to think differently a lot of us don't have the same budget as chipotle so you have to start thinking outside the box and maybe have some different offerings than some of your competitors and we'll go into those in the next few slides uh, if you have a smaller budget you got to be craftier i'm going to be talking about some of the free tools that are available to you and then usually if you don't have money, then it might or means that you need to put in some sweat equity. So maybe learning some design things, learning how to create some of these assets by yourself. And then um, as you, you know, develop and grow, you can eventually hire out some of these different aspects. And then honing in your uniqueness. What makes you stand out? Why are you different than um, other brands out there? So creating content, this is uh, the part one. For a lot of the content that you see on social media, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on your own website, you'll have some kind of text to accompany it. And I find that usually that first sentence really should be thoughtful. It should be a hook. It should intrigue people. Um, questions are a good way of hooking people or a statement that might be unique that people haven't read before. And just know that every sentence matters. So um, trying to cut out the fluff, being as concise as possible is going to go a long way. And then having imagery to accompany your post. Uh, if you are working at a company, uh, employees have iPhones, you know, taking photos of your day to day, um, making sure you remind people to um, use their phones to capture. If you're at a company event, take a, a selfie or any of a number of uh, different types of photo photos. Maybe someone did a cool design for the cake. I've seen that as a, a, a really good photo. And then you post that. Um, or you can hire a professional to come in and take photos uh, for you. That actually saves you a lot of time because you don't have to learn how to use the equipment. They can come in, capture a whole bunch of really that you know are going to be nice assets. It's one less thing to think about. 
And then you have all these nice photos that you can use for social media posts throughout the rest of the year. Um, you know, as long as people stay at your organization and people's looks don't change too much. And then another good resource is unsplash.com. That's a free resource for grabbing photos. Um, so, so you have the opportunity to highlight some of these photographers that put in, uh, put up their photos. That's what I usually like to do is give them a little shout out in the post. Um, but that's a, that's another good option for just getting content. Cause I think that's kind of where everyone's at right now. It's like, how do I create this content to be able to get things moving? And then some reminders about the content that you're creating. Um, you want to make sure that it's emotionally captivating. So how, what kind of feeling does it evoke for people? Does it make them feel happy or sad, inspired? Um, try to avoid maybe mad or angry uh, as a way, as a tactic for marketing. It is a marketing tactic of like kind of, um, kind of in your face. Uh, I, I forget the term for it, but just like, yeah, energized or trying to get people upset. But I, I don't know. I think there's better ways of doing that. And if you are going to post something, be a contributing person that's helping culture and helping society. Um, and then, you know, humanizing the content. I found that like when I highlight my own challenges in a lot of my t content, people that resonates with them and they're able to say, oh, okay, I can see myself and them. And I can, that, that problem they're going through that I've had that too. So I find that really leaning into your vulnerability, uh, Bren Brown, really big proponent for vulnerability and, and leaning into that and showing, you know, that you're human too, uh, and not just this faceless brand is a good way to resonate with your customers. And then part two, I have this example here. This is a campaign that I ran for a, a podcast that I ran, that I did a couple years ago called the creative quest podcast. And my idea with this podcast was to bring on people that I knew that were creative and try to get to the, the bottom of what makes people creative. Uh, why do people make things? Where does this passion stem from? And uh, it wasn't until after I made this series, I realized that uh, Freud, who's a, you know, the grandfather of psychology actually didn't even try to dive into creativity because he, he just thought it was too, uh, too challenging of a subject to dive into. So there we go. I was able to one up Freud, but <laughs> anyway, I uh, made a series of posts leading up to the launch day. So this could be helpful for you, you too as well. So if you're going to be doing a launch of a product or you have a new service coming out, build some anticipation, build some hype for that. And one of the posts that I did, this is something that we all can do if you have access to an iPhone, is uh, record yourself just talking into the camera, you know, explaining uh, what the promotion is going to be and where people can go to tune in for it. Usually these take me about two or three times before I really feel like I, I, I've got it. Uh, creating an outline for yourself can be helpful or if you feel comfortable enough talking off the cuff, but it does still take, even if I talk off the cuff, I have to reword it mentally a couple different times before it comes out just how I like it. And some of the free resources that I used was a Google, you can use Google Docs for scripting, you know, it's free. Google Sheets for, you know, hashtag organization. In this podcast, I'm not going to, or in this uh, speech, I'm not going to be talking about finding good hashtags, but it's nice to create a database. So that way you don't have to do that every time you know, just already have all those hashtags researched. And I find that hashtags that are around 200 to 500,000 followers are do really well. So we're using those ones, um, mainly because they're not overly saturated. They're not in the millions, but they're also not underutilized, such as the ones that maybe only have, I don't know, five or 10 or even a thousand people following. And Instagram is a free resource. So uh, it is one of those things where you have to put in your sweat equity to get your brand out there. And then some of the other uh, posts I did was on the launch day, said where they could find it. So that was that simple call to action. Go to Anchor to check it out. A little side note, if you launch a podcast, um, make sure that you um, maybe publish it the first episode a couple weeks before actually launching or else you might run into some processing issues, which is what I ran into. Um, and then the next one was just a highlight of one of the speakers. So just the kind of thinking, you know, uh, what can, not only can you promote the content, but maybe promoting some of the speakers that are uh, a part of your, 
whatever your product or service is that you're launching. So understanding each platform can be kind of tricky. So you went, this is why this speech has been a little tricky. So I've talked about kind of brand, you know, your story, uh, but for each platform, you want to tell your story differently. And I don't have time to dive into each of them, but uh, I would say just kind of a good general overlays over overview is that LinkedIn and Facebook have a lot of similarities. I would say LinkedIn has a more of a formal tone and there's definitely things that uh, people don't like to see posted on LinkedIn that you can get away with posting on Facebook. Um, for example, uh, I don't know, maybe what is your favorite like work related music playlist? You could, you know, it's work related. You could post it on Facebook, but you might get people a little upset on LinkedIn or they would just say, oh, why bother? This doesn't relate to me. So always thinking, you know, what is the mindset that people are in when they're on these different platforms? When you're on LinkedIn, you're probably looking to network, connect, um, grow in your career in some way. So keeping that in mind when you're posting uh, can be really helpful. Facebook, maybe a little bit more escapism is what people are going for. So can you create something that's going to be entertaining or just more fun for people? Instagram on that same note, but Instagram is very visual. Uh, I still have not figured out Instagram a hundred percent. I'm still working on it, but I would say it's more visual and uh, you know, video content does a lot better there and making sure that you utilize, uh, you know, faces do really well. Having your face on there, some kind of emotion uh, is a good way to keep people engaged. And then on your website, you know, similar kind of uh, mentality where you want to have something that's engaging. You want to make sure your text is, uh, concise. You want to make sure that it has that emotional element, some kind of appeal to keep people on your website. And uh, a website is where the journey is even more impactful, where what is that customer journey as they go from your homepage, when they click on the next uh, page, uh, how can you make things seamless? How can you make things easy and understandable for people? So think of the user experience, make sure that you're emotionally connecting. And then the other thing on each of these platforms, even on your own website, uh, be okay with being bold. Be okay with being different. How can you stand out from the competition? How can, uh, I think we're taught a lot of times, you know, growing up and in school, like blend in, just stay with the crowd. But when it comes to business, when it comes to being unique, or when it comes to standing out from the crowd, you need to be unique. You need to have those differentiating factors for um, how people see you as, I just got finished reading the uh, book, Purple Cow by Seth Godin, if you guys have heard of that one. And uh, pretty much it, Purple Cow is, the, that concept, when you think of a purple cow, it, it is what it is. So there's hundreds and thousands of cows that are all black and white, but then a purple cow would stand out and you're, if you were just driving down the road, going by pasture after pasture. And so you wanna be in business, that purple cow that stands out. So I've created a, um, or not, I haven't created, but I've added a few tools that can be really helpful for you. So when it comes to telling your story, you want to make sure you recycle that content for each of these platforms, especially as more and more platforms are being developed every single day, um, really stretching and getting the most out of uh, your story and your content. So if you're telling your origin story, repurpose that for Instagram, for LinkedIn, for Facebook, and um, not only repurposing directly what it is, but maybe you have a type of content that you can repurpose. And uh, what I've added here is if you're going from video to text, you can use otter.ai, which is a transcription software. I know some people are more of you know, they're, they're better speakers than they are writers. So maybe for you, it's to talk into your camera or talk into your microphone for 10 minutes and then have the transcription tell you what you said. Uh, and then you turn that into a blog post or you use that as a framework for another piece of content. Um, if you have text, you can turn it into audio um, by you know, recording your blog post and making an audio form. And then I use anchor.fm to share in the podcast form to different platforms. So that's if you're, and more in particular, if you're wanting to start a podcast. And then if you're wanting to go from audio to video, uh, this app called Headliner 
is really powerful for being able to plug in your audio file or your video file, and then you can, um, you know, convert that into a, a, a video file where it has, you know, the little waveforms that go up and down. Or if you want to add subtitles, this app is really good. It has a, a lot of features for a free app to be able to use. And what I found is a, a pro tip is create like an inspiration folder. If there's content that you see out there that you like, uh, screen grab that and add that to a folder and use that as inspiration for your own content. I, th I think that's a really uh, good way of going about it rather than trying to you know, dream up or try as many different things. You can just see what's already working out there and use that as inspiration for your own work. And I think it was on one of the other slides. Um, but while we're talking about content and the creation process and scaling, um, creating a content calendar can be really power, really impactful for um, just thinking and conceptualizing a whole year of content. And what's nice about a content calendar is you can reuse it for the following year. So because a lot of these holidays and special events that happen are cyclical and um, rather than having to recreate the wheel every time you can fall back on that. I don't have any links to good content calendars, but if you just do a quick Google search, you know, content calendar for my business, uh, there's a lot of good resources out there that'll kind of frame it up for you and help you with that process. Now, some of the pitfalls and things to avoid when it comes to creating your content, uh, let's learn from some of the bigger companies that have had some failings. So. I'll uh, pull that up on the next slide, but some of the things to avoid is coming across ingenuine or insensitive. Um, like you talked about earlier, being empathetic, but maybe you have someone that can review your content. Do you have a lot of these bigger companies, they have a marketing team that goes through many review processes, but for you, if you're bootstrapping it, maybe you have a, a friend, you have a spouse, or you have um, a small team that you can reach out to. But definitely review it and uh, think through worst case scenarios, and that'll save you a lot of uh, you know, heartache down the road. The other one is making sure that your content isn't too bland or formal. Uh, those two things will make sure that you get lost in the, the fray of all the other content that's out there. You want to make sure it looks like it makes it make sure that it looks original. It's uh, reflective of who you are incorporating those, those story elements um, to make sure that uh, you're telling something that's authentic to who you are. And um, you know what the good news is that there's only one you, there's only one of your company. So being able to tell this story from your perspective, only you can do it. So trying to do that in a way that's not uh, you know, stodgy or been done before. And as well, don't ignore feedback. I think this is a really good one. Um, if you're getting comments on your posts, positive or negative, Use that as a you know a guiding light of what kind of content should you create next. Now, uh, again, take that with a grain of sand. Maybe you have a family member. I've heard from people in the past that maybe you have a family member who isn't as supportive and they're going to post something on whatever your content is, or maybe they're going to criticize the story that you're telling. Um, but yeah, use your own kind of inner voice to see through that and uh, continue treading the path that you know is like, you know, true to who you want to be. Um, and then as well with that feedback, um, you know, you, maybe you get the feedback that's too frequent. Uh, these are some things that you want to play around with depending on what your brand is um, and what you're trying to accomplish. But uh, most people don't have that problem of posting too frequently. And if you do have that issue, maybe it's a matter of creating kind of a separate account for your business uh, because most businesses are posting, you know, some are posting three to four times a day, uh, but just because of the algorithm, it doesn't show up as much. So keep that in mind. Um, and then making sure that you're not posting just the similar kind of content over and over again. Can you add some variety, humanize it, um, maybe do something similar to what Depop does, where they post a few things about their own brand, but bring, you know, use surveys or talk about something that's going on um, relevant to, uh, you know, the world circumstances. And yeah, just try not to be annoying. <laughs> so I have an example here of kind of a pitfall, uh, one that didn't go so well. This is Burger King. Uh, they've done some good marketing in the past, but this recent one, I think this was in the last two weeks, this one did not do as well and did not land as well. Um, 
yeah, I, this one doesn't need a lot of explanation. I don't know how it made it through so many uh, marketing professionals because I know they have a huge team. Um, but yeah, this one definitely did not land. And um, yeah, there's a fine line between like being bold and being offensive. So I, I think what they were trying to do here is they, they were putting together a scholarship titled Helping Equalize Restaurants. Um, they, uh, it just, they could have done a million other different things and this is the route that they went, uh, but they did, uh, they circled up back pretty quickly and put out an apology, but, uh, this is probably something that's going to hurt them for a couple years to come. So that's, uh, something to keep in mind. I, they could have benefited from maybe a small test group run it by some people, um, or just being empathetic. So, yeah, I guess that is um the slide i have one other slide after this one but that's kind of in a nutshell i have a tendency to talk really fast um so if you guys have any questions um i will say uh at this time a lot of the all the donations are going to passion impact which is a um an organization here in portland that helps team students with volunteer opportunities so if you're a student you're not really sure if you're pa in your path in life, they help people find their passion and then use that to make an impact with uh, volunteer organizations here in Portland. So um, that's where all the donations from today are going towards. But I kind of flew through story and I think, and I kind of grazed over some of the different social platforms, but maybe I can answer some questions that you might have that are specific um, to your business or that are specific to a, um, a particular platform. So are there any questions out there? Hey, Brian, I got a comment, not a question, but uh, it was one of the things you touched on earlier in the presentation. Uh, by the way, thank you for this. This is great. Um, happy to be here. Um, it was, um, gosh, it was early on, I, I don't know, slide three or four. But one thing I want to mention is um, I worked in content marketing um, as one of my first marketing gigs. And <clears throat> I think speaking of the algorithms of social media, I think none of us really know what the algorithm is unless we actually work for the company. But um, one thing um, I do want to know, and everyone, please fact check me and, you know, things have definitely changed. But <clears throat> um, being a little bit too clickbaity with um, with uh, you know, your posts, right? So, I, you know, I believe we were taught that Facebook has an algorithm that can read um, certain words that are used um, in your text. Um, so things like click here, watch this um, are flagged. Um, and it's it's something that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, um, I kind of want to avoid, um, you know, a lot of it has to do with uh, just the sharing of, you know, news that isn't necessarily true. Um, but uh yeah clickbait um yeah clickbait like you're you know you're baiting people to to go ahead and yep exactly so <laughs> um so anyways yeah just something I, I want everyone to research on um you know if, again things always change with the algorithms but like you know if you're if you're too aggressive with like hey subscribe watch you know listen um you know the social media platforms will be a little um you know, they'll, they'll basically knock your reach, right? And you won't be able to reach as many people. So it actually ends up hurting you. Uh, but yeah, please, please, you know, do your research and fact check me. But that was something that we were told. So just wanted yeah. to share that. No, I appreciate that, Trent. Yeah, that's um, a big part of it is... And I think that kind of falls in that discussion of like being like everyone else. If everyone's saying, hey, click here, do this, uh, you're not really being different from other brands. And um, yeah, honing in on... I don't know, telling like an authentic true story to who you are that the kind of the, yeah, the clickbait, like cultural phenomenon, it's been around for a while. I think I remember like the early websites of the nineties, that was like part of their thing was like clickbait, something that pops out. And then you like, you got to click on it because they create some kind of intrigue where it's a very misleading headline and it sends you there and you're like, okay, this isn't what I thought I was getting. So that's a big part of that. Uh, as well talking about that promise that you make to your customer like clickbait is where you make a promise but you don't fulfill it so um, if you said that you're going to talk about x y and z in this article we'll definitely talk about those in your blog post or whatever uh, you know the deeper bit of information that you're trying to share with your audience yeah hey jen just asked a really great question um so how do you go about how do you go about your call to action um 
that's that's like the the, the magic question there. Um, you know, I, I, I can't give you an example on the top of my head, but, you know, it's just wordsmithing, you know, trying to changing up your words. So it's not so clickbaiting. Um, I'm sure there's articles on, on the web that kind of help you, you know, you know, think of the right word. Um, I, I think we try to avoid the, uh, the word watch specifically. Um, and then, you know, instead of watch, I think we use like check, like check this out or I don't, you know, I'm just thinking on top of my head, this was years ago, but, um, yeah, something fun, something personal. Where it's right. like, yeah, and making sure you switch it up. If all of your posts at the end of them say like, hey, click watch here, I imagine that probably gets flagged as well. For sure. And I think that's a that's a really good comment. I appreciate it, Trent. Um, yeah, there are a couple other questions. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, this is Spencer Crandall. My question is about your the key areas of story between the origin story, client success, and culture, which one of those do you think, or how would they sort of tier in terms of what are the most important stories to tell than the other, the types of stories that have the best impact? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It's going to be kind of a tough answer for me because uh, you're not going to like this answer, but it kind of depends. Um, so customer, I would say for me, in my own mind, like the, the first one that you should tell is that like hero story, which is your customer. That's the most important for your brand because uh, that's where the customer can see themselves in your brand. But then the, you know, a close second is that origin where explaining, you know, who you are, or what you're about, because that's the, the next question that your customer is going to have. Once they see themselves having, you know, success, like they can envision, they can visualize themselves having a good experience because they've seen someone else have a good experience, but then they're going to ask themselves that next question. Well, who is this company that I want to work with? What is this product? And so that origin would be the next one. And then the cultural, or those are kind of the icing on the cake. Those are kind of just ways that you're showing up for the community, way that you're showing up on, uh, you know, different platforms, way that, ways that you're uh, engaging and being more than just this uh, faceless brand. You're actually bringing personality and um, showcasing who you are. So I hope that's helpful. That's kind of, yeah, in my mind, how I would tier them. Uh, but not always, but I wouldn't say those are the easiest ways. I would say, um, and now this is where it gets kind of that depends answer. But a lot of times when I'm working with brands, that first story that I start with is that origin one. When I, a brand video is kind of that first one that I would recommend for people to make. Um, and that evolves over time, you know, as your business grows, as you grow. So maybe you make one, you know, that first video, hey, I'm Brian, I, you know, my company, this is why I'm passionate about what I do. And then in a year or two years, maybe you evolve and you grow upon that origin story. Um, but that one's the easiest. That's the first one to start. So I don't know, kind of conflicting, but it depends on kind of uh, what your business needs are. Thanks, thanks, yeah. Brian. Yeah, I was thinking about like those things and also if you were to, let's just say you had all of them and you were spending advertising on them, which ones would sort of have the most impact? Yeah, I would imagine the success story. Yeah, testimonials do really well. So if you have any examples of clients, customers having a good time, a good experience, uh, people can see themselves in them. Um, I'll go back to the, actually that other slide, the story one. Um, cause I think that kind of, I probably flew through it. This has the different types for mm -hmm. people. And, and Brian, I, this is Kim. I have a question about length of videos and for for different platforms, I, I know it's sometimes different, but what is a, a sweet spot in terms of a length of video for people to pay attention to and not not check out of it? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And then I have to kind of yeah, bring up the different platform like types to a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget what it was. There's something, you know, people's attention span is like that of a, of a goldfish, but which is like seven seconds. And that's why like Vine was so popular. Um, but I would say, again, it, it depends. I, I would say for the average person that's just like scrolling along, I try to keep it within that one minute frame. I think that's why Instagram has made it, you know, limiting to just one minute. So if you are going to create a piece of content, maybe stick to one minute, that way you can reuse it on all of those platforms as well. Uh, change the dimensions, switch the text a little bit around for each of those platforms. But that's a nice one that I aim for is one minute. So that way you can put it on Instagram, you could then put it on LinkedIn, and you, you could then put it on Facebook. 
but the depends part comes in. So what part are they in the, the buyer's journey? Mm -hmm. So if they are wanting to learn a little bit more about that product, maybe they are willing to sit for like a 10 minute webinar if they're um, just on the cusp of wanting to make a purchasing decision. So if they're still kind of hesitant or don't really know who you are, the shorter, the better, because you're just trying to get people you know, a little bit more acclimated. It's kind of like making a new friend. They have like a, a little brief interaction, little brief interaction, every little brief interaction leads up to a longer, you know, whether that's a, a 10 minute webinar or eventually talking with, with you. Um, but yeah, each of the platforms have their limiting factors. I think LinkedIn, it's limited to 10 minutes. Um, whereas I think Facebook is about there as well. It might be a little longer. Um, and then, yeah, YouTube is, on the shorter side, I think that's like 10 minutes. And then once you have like a premium account, then they bump you up to unlimited, but uh, hopefully that's helpful. Um, but I like, I like the one minute, minute and a half. Once you start getting to like three minutes, no one really wants to watch if they're just randomly scrolling through their platform. Cause you have to keep in mind, people are going on to LinkedIn or Facebook to, you know, escape to a degree or they just want to be entertained or have fun. Um, so it's really hard to maintain that element of fun and engagement throughout. But um, yeah, unless you're very thoughtful with your media and content, maybe you're working with a, a professional. Yeah, I know there's a product called Bomb Bomb, which embeds email or videos into email. And they recommend 10 to 15 seconds because it's just supposed to be something really quick to grab people's attention to continue on with that email or go to the call of action, which is usually just sign on to an event or you know to follow up with something with that company but it's kind of interesting that it, it embeds right there so you don't have to click on a link to open it when you open the email the the video starts up as soon as you open it yeah and i guess just to let everyone you know get a second chance at bomb bomb yeah is the name of that software i haven't used it personally i've kind of just recorded my own personal videos and sent them to clients but the the unique factor that bomb bomb offers is you are able to embed the video in there right now you can't you don't have a functionality for that and so i i don't know how many of the people tune in and have their own newsletter but i know for myself when i put out a newsletter you have to do like a little thumbnail of what you want the video to be on and so when people click it they're not actually clicking on the video they're clicking on a thumbnail that's then taking them uh to the video to be able to watch the full length um but that's a nice feature and yeah we didn't talk a lot about video in particular in uh, today's presentation, but that has um, much more of a, you know, impactful way of resonating with your, your customer, especially when you create a custom video, like, Hey, it was really nice meeting you at this networking event. I'd like to see how we might be a good match. Um, you know, please reach out. Something of that nature um, is a really good way of making people feel special and unique. Cause that's what we're trying to do at the end of the day is how do, can you create like a, a unique experience? How can you make something uh, create something that's memorable? for people. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that stands out for me as, as somebody who's shy and I don't like my face on, on video much, but I see people like uh, Benefit Corporations for Good was genius about this, where they'll make a video connecting a bunch of slides, music, verbiage, and photos. And you never actually see the person, but they can tell a beautiful story hmm. by, by splicing together a lot of things that way. And it looks very classy and professional too. That's a lot of effort that, and skill that a lot of us don't have, but it is a way of telling a story and then you know talking into a mic and telling the story is another way too. So there's a lot of ways to do it. Yeah, I would love to see that. I would, um, you know, my background comes from like multimedia. And so that sounds like more of a multimedia piece where it's just, mm -hmm. yeah, those photos voiceover music and yeah that might be a good way for people to still tell their brand story and that's how yeah, i'm glad you brought that example up because that's a good way of doing it um if you don't have a bigger budget maybe you can reuse some free software and do that sequencing of steps to tell your story making sure that you're you know have that hook you're getting people excited have a promise and then yeah through those different slides and text being able to tell it and make sure you're answering that question at the beginning or answer that question at the end that you gave everyone at the beginning. I have a question, Brian. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm asking it correctly or if it makes sense, but 
Have you noticed with uh, brands or companies that are posting, you know, on Facebook, Instagram, I use mostly Instagram for, for, what, for what I do, um, that they're able to tell their brand story in one post? Or is it like uh, sort of stretched out into various posts to create one story? You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I'm trying to just imagine <laughs> fitting your whole story in one post. And I'm having a hard, and so, I mean, I suppose you could do both ways, but I, I'm just curious as to what you see more of. Yeah, I think what, uh, if I'm getting it right, like a lot of brands will probably try to do that with their very first post is like, yeah, cram everything in there. Um, but a good way that I've heard of thinking about Instagram is you think of it like a, a coffee table, like book that you would pick up. So if you were to pick up this coffee table book, um, would that first page have everything about them? Maybe, um, you know, you sometimes see like a little backstory, but I, I think it's probably too challenging to squeeze everything in about your organization into one post, especially, you know, if you're trying to, you know, do something innovative or, uh, you're comp it's a complicated organization. Um, so try to yeah break those stories up if you can. Um, that first post, maybe you kind of do like a, a, a basic attempt at it. I know a lot of people, they'll put like their company logo up and then explain, you know, maybe just the backstory. Um, but it should be a journey along the way is how I kind of see it. So every single post should be like a brick that's building upon that story that is uh, your organization. And then keeping your customer at the kind of the forefront, seeing them as the hero along the way. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if I answered that super well, but I would say, um, yeah, breaking it out, you have like, you have so many different posts to be able to continue to tell that story. Um, but it comes down to you and what your preference is as well. Um, yeah, I, I can see it, uh, being pretty challenging to tell that whole story in just one post. So yeah, maybe use the first five or something of that nature, or you do similar to like what I did for that creative quest launch. Um, maybe it's a series of posts that kind of work together cohesively um, to tell that story. But yeah, people are doing more and more innovative things every single day. So yeah. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna take a look at the chat to see how we look on questions. Uh, I think you covered most of the questions and there were a few. Yeah, I, I had said one a little while ago, it was just like, what do you see as trends for these platforms? Like if I was like a first time small business, like just getting started with social media right now in 2021, like what would you, like where would you think would be like the best place to start? Yeah, um, that's a really good question and kind of where I see them going. Um, I would say you got to take inventory of what your brand is or who you are. If you're a very visual brand, you have something that you can actually physically show like a product, um, going to Instagram is, would, would be the best spot for that. But if your you know, clientele is more corporate, more, um, you know, business oriented LinkedIn is like, makes the most sense. And LinkedIn apparently is showing some of the same, uh, things that like are the same kind of trends that Facebook had like five, 10 years ago, where you can post something and it has and post something on LinkedIn and it'll have a much greater reach. Whereas if you post something today on Facebook, it kind of caps out on how many people you can, you can reach out to. Um, and then the big trend for, if you're very visual, maybe you're more fun and you're more creative. TikTok is a super powerful trend right now. Um, and then people have recommended Clubhouse. So if you're in the podcast space, being able to do a live stream on Clubhouse is a good one. Um, as far as like, where do I see things going? Uh, LinkedIn will probably be here to stay and just continue to get bigger. Um, keep your eyes and ears peeled for something new coming out uh, at any time. A, a new app could come out to really you know disrupt things. And there's value in being the first on a new app that comes out. So that's what I'm kind of excited about is like, you know, these other apps are kind of mature now. I think Facebook has been around since, I don't know, 2005, maybe 2007. Um, you know, keep in mind, like whatever this new, whatever the new platform that is, that it does come out, hopping onto that one, because there's value in being first. So all the brands that created a, a, page, a page on Facebook that you could like in 2007, 
they're doing so much better today than if you were to start one of these now. But um, I guess to kind of bring this full circle, if you are starting something today, yeah, take inventory of what your brand is. If you're visual, if you're more, um, you know, text or uh, I don't know, less less exciting. You just pick the platform that makes more sense to you, like a, a, a Twitter of a nature. I kind of botched that answer, but <laughs> thank you for the question, Eric. It was a little bit of a challenging one. Uh, what is a CTA? Okay. Um, yeah, that's very helpful. So uh, a CTA is a call to action. Um, essentially, yeah, what is that call? What are you asking someone to do when they've uh, watched your video or engaged with your content? Um, what's that next step? Because sometimes people, you'll notice this, they'll, they'll put out a lot of great content, a lot of awesome content, but then not have you do any action afterwards. So you're like, oh man, that was, you have this great feeling and you're walking away from it, but then you don't have the next step. So people aren't really capitalizing on all of the hard work they went into creating that content. So um, yeah, call to action is definitely a key at the end of anything that you do. I work in, I do a lot of Toastmasters and that's a, a speech development organization. And at the end of each of the speech, I definitely ask people like, Hey, what do you want people to do? Do you want them to look up their own information? Do you want them to take their own action? Um, hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. Um, I, I was also thinking uh, when Snapchat first came out, we were kind of told this, this will be the greatest thing for business. And it, it kind of still turns out to be more personal. But then I've been reading that TikTok has been a place where I, like doctors have been connecting to patients with stories on, on TikTok. And, the, and th that some social good has been happening on TikTok that way. And how um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did a lot through, I think it was Instagram, TikTok, and and maybe Snapchat. So it, it's kind of interesting, but that some of those seem like more social channels than than business outreach channels. But people seem to use anything for anything if it, if your audience is there. It's hard to know though. And then it gets to the point where it's a full time job to juggle all the channels. And it can take so much time. So it's like pick a sweet spot one or two and stick with them. Yeah. And Hard to know. no, I think that's a that's a really good point. And I've heard similar stories. Yeah, people in the healthcare, yeah, finding a dentist through TikTok. Who would have thought? But um yeah, it does get to be quite a bit creating content. So that's why I, I had that slide about repurposing. So if you are going to create one piece of content for LinkedIn or Facebook, trying to find ways to repurpose it across the other platform, other channels is going to save you time. But yeah, it does come into the fact maybe you should hire a professional to help supplement or you know ease the load of a lot of this. Um, I'm just reading some of the chats. OHSU is a harassment. Oh, I didn't know they had a, so that's a case where things can go kind of, uh, you know, work against you. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, he went famous, he went viral for the TikTok dancing. And I guess he was a resident and now he's in another state and he's on a leave of absence because someone that worked with him at OHSU has um, char like brought a case against him. Oh my goodness. So he, he didn't, the case didn't come from TikTok. He, but but he was all famous for that. And now there's news about the case against him. Oh, wow. So it's more of a reflection, I guess, of his character. And it just happened to be he had this viral piece of content. I mean, yeah, that's well, yeah, the... he had the viral video and everyone thought he was great, that he was this dancing TikTok doc. And now you're hearing another side of how he conducted himself when he was a resident. Gosh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just... Well there's another doctor that's reaching out to um, the black community to try and get more and more people to get vaccines and he does it all through rap on tiktok and then he also created a cartoon so it's a, a cartoon tiktok rap about how important it is to get the vaccine and it's really caught on and yeah, yeah it's a it's one of those platforms where uh myself in particular, I, you know, I haven't explored it heavily as much as I would have would like, but uh, if you are of the creative mind and you like music, it's a good way to be able to connect with people kind of, that's what I find are the things that do really well is a fusion of two mm -hmm. concepts. So they've fused music and dancing with, you know, information or entertainment or, you know, something that you want to get across that's educational. 
So, um, yeah, it requires a little bit more of thinking outside the box. I, it's not something I've explored very much, uh, as much as I would have liked, as I would, as much as I would like, but it's something that's on my horizon. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think you're right, uh, Brian, that new platforms will come about. Um, so it's, it's, it's really hard to, to know. I think for everybody, just find what's a sweet spot for you that reaches your customers because you don't have to reach everybody. You have to reach the right, reach the right people. But story is the, the thing. Whenever you use the storytelling has to be a, a really big part of it. And think of the companies you know and love. Sometimes it's not just because of the product. You know something about what they do, how they do it, what they're passionate about. That's, it's a big deal, especially in social enterprise. People gravitate toward companies because they know, they know the story is they care and the story is how. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Trenton. Yeah, thank you, Trent. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and we've got um, uh, coming up, uh, Ned River Zenas is going to talk um, in a month or so about LinkedIn and how to really you know, mine LinkedIn for all the treasures that it has. And um, I know Eric and I are, are you know, working together on forthcoming events. And sometimes we'll put people in hot seats where you can present what you're doing and, and get feedback from the crowd live on, on LinkedIn, on our Zoom. So you know, yeah, Nedra, yeah, Nedra is a really good resource, a really good example of uh, someone that does it awesome job on social media using that story technique of you know, an emotional element that gets people you know engaged right away and then she has she does an awesome job of having a call to action at the end of each of her posts too to you know what can you do whether that's hey comment below if you agree or disagree with me that's a powerful way to get people engaged and um yeah and she usually has some kind of image that uh, i think really distinctively like last fall she had some you know, like maybe it was just her backyard. She posted that. And that was, um, you know, something that resonated with me. Cause I was like, Oh, she's a real person. She has a, her own, you know, space that she lives and works in. And I think it was something about remote working. So, uh, any number of things, you know, we all have access to this, uh, or not all of us, but if you're fortunate enough to have a phone, you also have a camera and, um, you can highlight a lot of the different things, um, in your day beyond just, uh, maybe what, what food you had that, that morning, <laughs> but maybe your workspace, that can be a piece of content or, uh, your front door, you know, that could be door of opportunities. Uh, the sky's really the limits of, um, different things that you can take photos of, or maybe your couch, you're like, Hey, I'm feeling lazy today. And that might resonate with people because there's certain days where people don't feel as uh, motivated. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I'm so happy for all these people who are here. Does anyone else have any questions or, uh, cause we also want to open it up for you to share what you're doing and, and who you are too. Yeah, I think, well, someone had a question about clubhouse is an app streaming podcast is close. Yeah. That's, I, that's the one that's trending a little bit more right now. It's, um, it's just only does live and it's a ways to be able to connect with uh, people in a live group. I think you create your own room. So then people see when your room is live. So I think if you are creating some consistent on a more of a regular basis, maybe you can tell people like, Hey, every Wednesday I'm going live on uh, clubhouse, but it's just audio, no visual or anything else. And you're not supposed to record it either, unless the person running the room tells people they're recording it. Yeah. So it has that kind of Snapchat effect where it's yeah. only in the moment. That was me, Brian. Just real quick. Are you, so you're not on, you're not using Clubhouse because you're supposed to be invited <laughs> by somebody, by a user. So I was just curious, but um, I haven't started the podcast yet. I'm planning on starting a podcast. So when I'm ready, I'll, I'll reach out to somebody. Yeah. If you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, I don't currently use it, but I got an invite recently. So um yeah, it's one of those things. There's so many options out there. And so just gradually adding each of them. Um, so for me with my processes, it's still like a process just to get the podcast going. So to do the live element is just another thing, but you know, slowly but surely I'll, I'll build it on there. I'm on Clubhouse. And in terms of podcasting, the Global PodFest that was just last week and the week before, they're going to have, they have more coming up like VidFest and there's often a free ticket level. Cool. Oh, that's good to know. Thanks. This is Wolf Wolf, by the way. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Wolf Wolf. 
Do we have Sorry, any? Carolyn, did you say, what was it called? Global Podcast? Global Podfest. Podfest, thank you. Actually, I think I said it backwards again. Podfest Global. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And they do a Podfest, they do VidFest. I'm at Harbor Journal on the number two, and it's on it's on my pages. My Instagram is without the number two. And they got a world record for having 5,000 people in a virtual conference back in March, and they just apparently got another world record for 6,000 and something. They were trying for 10. Wow. wow. Hey, uh, Brian, if you want, you can unscreen share, and everybody can go to gallery view so we can see each other. Sure. I, right. I, I did go on... Um, on Clubhouse a couple times, and mostly it was people across the nation discussing a topic. Um, like uh, one, one that was about anti-racism and changing policies, and it, it was really good. And you can't see people, but you can see their avatars. And it's, it's all uh, audio, but the audio is actually pretty clear. And then there's others that are just like a get together dinner party, but you can follow people. And so when I see that, say Seth Godin is on a, a clubhouse, that's one I might want to connect to, but it kind of depends on topic. And There's a lot of famous people on there. I've noticed some of the most famous people have no bio listed. And um, they also had a Lion King all black cast performing and there were people like that that are out of work from Broadway. And then they did another, um, I don't remember the name of the second musical they did, but they've had some really good stuff on there. And like, I'm part of the Never Settle. Um, the Never Settle show premieres tomorrow for the new season on YouTube at 3 p.m. But um, I'm an ambassador for the Never Settle show and it's Mario Armstrong and he has, um, like he did it six hours. Unfortunately, I've been having trouble sleeping and I've been sleeping during the day and I missed all six hours of it, but I went to part of the after show, but um, they have some good content there that he offers like for free. And I put my haps in yeah. the chat. So haps you know, is a new live point. streaming. So, so many different ways to get on. What? Sorry, Kim. What did you say? Oh, just the just to the original point. Was, oh, just there's so many different things to choose. It, it's really a broad array of of ways to get information and connect with people. Yeah, but I like the tip that you mentioned earlier. Where yeah, yeah, stick with one or two, maybe. Um, especially at the early stages, just do one for three to six months, and if if it's working, build upon it with another one, and then see if you can kind of recycle the content. Um, and then if it's like just not working at all, just yeah, kind of fail fail fast. I think is the mentality for entrepreneurs. So if it's not working, switch over to the next uh, platform quickly. Um, can I say something about HAPS? Because you can broadcast to like six platforms at one time from there. Yeah, well, you can on sweet too. There are some play those. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Marilyn. You're welcome. Although I can't broadcast from anywhere on my computer because there's the studio is broken and I'm still trying to figure out if there's any chance it's on my end or if it's on their end because Periscope's ending on the, the last day of this month. Hmm. So any, anybody else might want to introduce who they are and their, what they're working on? Oh, Jen? Sure. I, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be part of this community. I didn't know about LinkedIn PDX, uh, local PDX. So um, I wrote it in the chat earlier, but I started a singing telegram service a couple of years ago. And um, I think out of all my musician friends, I've been the only one actually continuing to do live music because it's just me showing up at people's doorsteps. So um, whether, and then, you know, there's the virtual ones too. So, and I'm finding that the best way, to, honestly, to get the word out is word of mouth. Um, I've given up on paid advertising, whether it's on LinkedIn, Facebook, it's just, I, unless you really, really know what you're doing and you have money to hire somebody who knows what you're doing, it's, it's a waste of my money. It's a waste of money, I've, I've, I've noticed. So um, I'm not gonna do the paid advertising anymore and, and just mostly just do word of mouth. And then now that with the warm weather coming out, I'll be out in the streets more because um, busking is my favorite way of advertising actually. So um, hopefully 
you'll <laughs> hear me on a curbside or a park near you. <laughs> You're braver than me. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Jen, did you put a, if you have a website or anything, you're welcome yeah, to put down that. Again, because it's yeah. not buried. But yeah. Sure. That'd be and, cool. Uh, and I'm, yeah, trying to figure out how to tell my story on uh, LinkedIn, you know, just planning out posts. And I have somebody helping me, but I'd like to learn how to do it myself. And it's, uh, there's a lot going on, you know, and like what you said, Brian, about wanting to, um, tell, uh, have a different sort of voice on each platform or say it a little bit different in, differently on e depending on the platform you're on. So it's just a lot to remember. And oh, uh, one last thing, actually, my, the one, the woman who's helping me with marketing was saying, you know, you don't want to be posting the same post on Instagram and on Facebook on the same day. Yeah. You'll, you can schedule them out, but, and I've been using, um, well, I was using buffer, but now I'm using, um, business, Facebook business suite. Um, why not? It's the same company. You can post both places at the same time. Okay. Um, but I, just the point is, is that um, I recently learned that you'd want to do one post for Facebook, like, you know, like a customer testimonials on Mondays, right? On Facebook. And then on Mondays on Instagram, you want to do a different kind of post and just remember to just mix it up a bit. Is that your mm -hmm. take too? Yeah. 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 And Nicole Salam and Polly, welcome. It, it, and Seth, if you have anything you know, to share, that's awesome. We welcome. Welcome. Anything. Well, if I wanted you to meet his friend, this is Bear. Oh, that's nice. So one of the things we teach in, um, in the SBDC programs is branding. And with that is you know, branding needs to be consistent. When you have a brand, that definitely needs to be consistent. But you can, you can change your story your story or the length of it but once you get some some capital that's working for you your logo your colors your iconography your um, whatever you do to represent yourself keeping that consistent will really help people find you across all the platforms too and otherwise it just gets too confusing you know if you're changing color schemes and fonts and and things like that so that's where consistency really works when you set yourself up to you set your brand where you like it. Yeah, keeping yeah. things cohesive. And yeah, like I like had earlier that uh, like that Dove uh, Instagram page, you know, even it could be as little as just having the logo on whatever the image is in there or um, yeah, maybe a frame, like a border around whatever your piece of content is that's the same color as your uh, logo. Those are all different mm -hmm. ways to keeping things concise. And, and then use the same picture, like, so that especially if you're on live streaming platforms so people know it's you same name and same picture yeah exactly and um, go ahead we have a web guru in our midst with marianne who's super good at you know, blogging and and also you know the other thing great way to tell a story is emails and emails that are come from websites and blogs and that's a really consistent way because I learned in digital marketing strategy that of all the platforms consistently, the one that gets the most open rates as percentage is email. So that's where yeah. your MailChimp and, and um, Constant Contact, Emma, all of those are really valuable tools as well. Yeah, email is still coveted. People, they, you know, People don't care about having a bunch of, you know, you can have a hundred notifications. They're almost excited on the different platforms, but a hundred emails in your uh, inbox can almost give you a heart attack. So uh, just working through uh, people want to clear out their emails. So they're more likely to, if they're a subscriber, they're probably a legitimate fan, someone that actually, you know, wants to get your content. And, and blogs are great ways to tell stories. And Marianne taught me how to write blogs out of WordPress. And it's great. And they go straight to social. And um, I didn't introduce myself before. I'm Marilyn, and I'm a disabled live streamer. And I've been home for over a year, which has been quite the challenge. And I actually have a vaccine appointment for Friday. Fantastic. Good for you, Marilyn. Thank you. I'm glad you have that. The more people that get vaccinations, the better we'll all feel. I, I'm Mary Ann, and I wanted to just follow up. Can say about about emails because it that really is 
the best way. And I, what I've found is when I do a blog post, then I can write an email and I won't put the whole thing in a blog post, but that gives me some really good content. And I'll put like maybe the first paragraph of the first couple sentences and then link it to the blog post. And those get pretty good opens because it's something I've really thought about it. It's not spammy. It's something I, I want it permanently on my website. And so I don't do it very often, but um, that's a good way to get the word out too, is, is yeah. just use it carefully, use email carefully. Well, actually there's a, Marianne, you wrote an email January 7th and I actually have kept it because it was about 2020 reflection. And I, I sent it to myself saying, write like this. <laughs> and, and, and Brian, you were talking about keeping your inspirations. And that was one of the things that is an inspiration. And I just keep it off to a corner. And, and it's like how, how she formed the words, how it was reflective, how it was, it was really amazing. And, and you know, we can do that with all sorts of things, but keep those nuggets and say, okay, that's an inspiration. And because that's exactly what I thought about that January 7th email. It's good to hang on to for inspiration. It was beautiful. That's on, that's on the website, waterlinkweb. Dot com. So you can always log in there and look at the news blog and read it if you like. Well, and the other thing about stories is um, and anything that can create searchability to the story is good too. So still pulsing some keywords into things. Do you say water link? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I can put it in the chat for you. Yeah, to I, piggyback on that. Oh, sorry, go for it. Sorry. No, no, I just wanted to say thanks for putting this together. Um, I just was really interested in, I, I'm interested in storytelling as well as yeah. uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur uh, just for my whole life. So I uh, love the two topics together. I've, I've read the book and I love the book especially, but it's really neat to see a group being presented here uh, locally in PDX. So I just thought I'd stop in and see what you guys were up to. Well, Seth, we're really Hopefully. glad you're here. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate you stopping by. Yeah, I think it's a very popular book. And so it's awesome that you uh, have read it and incorporate it at some, um, yeah, made it perfect. I think it's it's probably for me in the last couple of years, one of the bigger reads. Uh, that's something that kind of, they have so many stories interwoven between it and you're, it's, it gives you like the aha, okay, now I get why, yeah. um, you know, FedEx has the arrow in their logo or, um, you know, why people do things a certain way because it, it sticks in the minds of your customer, um, you know, guiding them along. So I think yeah, that the story cool. brand and the mom test are my two favorite uh, books for the year. Um, the mom <laughs> test is <clears throat> not story driven, but it's essentially about how you test things that you think are good ideas for entrepreneurial businesses. But, you know, your mom will, will tell you that she loves those ideas, uh, but the market may not tell you the same thing. So. <laughs> um yeah some really great books coming out that reminds me i uh i used to play this game called guitar hero and one of the signs one of the slides was uh, your mom doesn't count as a fan <laughs> right <laughs> why not Sometimes well hopefully she counts and hopefully fan. she is a fan <laughs> yeah <laughs> but hopefully you have more than your mom exactly your yeah well, that's like, that's the big, I heard a really good quote from someone. They're like, do you have any mentors? Do you have any guides? They're like, no, I don't have a mentor. They're, the market is my mentor is what this, per, this entrepreneur said. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Cause like, yeah, the market will tell you if they like it or not literally nowadays with a, a you know, a digital like, but um, no, that's a, that's a really good test. And hopefully you have, you know, you've gone to market beforehand with some, you know, prototypes and things before you've invested, you know, boatloads of money into whatever your product is. I think there's the, the famous pursuit of happiness where the guy went and bought, you know, hundreds of these really expensive uh, devices and then they weren't usable at all or the, the, you know, he had a hard time selling them. So the demand wasn't there. So yeah, doing testing on a small scale can save you a lot of heartache. Well, and just how you test to asking the right questions, because even when you're in a test market, your audience a lot of times wants to please you. And so they're really going to look for ways to say what they think you want to hear, which corrupts your data. And like, if you tell your mom, Hey, I want to, I want to go be a rock star and sing to plants. She's probably going to be, that's a good idea, honey, you go do it. So you quit your job and you pull out your savings and you go sing to plants, you know, and it's, uh, you know, maybe not the best idea. So 
I think it's 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 wonderful to be able to tell stories and to be able to engage people on an emotional level, but also understanding that not every story, no matter how clever you are with your words or your SEO or how you put together that business model is necessarily has an audience. Yeah. Yeah. And being, I know it's a, it's a tough skill, but it's a a good one to have if you can visualize yourself in the shoes of your, of your audience and the better you're at doing that, better that you can put yourself into their shoes, the better um, you, you can differentiate which stories you should share. Sure. I think that's what, uh, and Seth Godin's yeah, Purple Cow book, he's like, yeah, if you can put yourself in the shoes of your audience, you have a, a job ahead of you, or you're like, you have a, a solid, uh, I don't know, place in the market. It's like, it's its own skill set. Sure. Well, thank you guys so much. I'm going to jet. I got to get back to work. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate you hopping on Seth. Yeah, you have an awesome setup there. I'm oh, curious thanks. if you're a podcaster yourself or a, a YouTuber. No, neither of those actually. I um, I do like story story building for IPs and and for pitches for like networks and stuff. So, oh, wow. um, but um, yeah, I'm also a software developer. So I, I've built a lot of internal tools that I use for um, just making like an software uh, making story um, creation a little bit easier. And so I'm 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 just always fascinated what other people are trying to do with it. You know, building a kind of combining business with storytelling because I think it's powerful so yeah you know it makes me think of especially like Super Bowl commercials sometimes you know the ones that make you cry but when you've got 30 seconds or 20 seconds to tell a story and one that stuck with me had absolutely no words to it at all but it was this older man who lived alone and it would show him he bought some weights and he was lifting weights and working out because he was trying to lift something he couldn't. So he kept working out and bought hand weights and go for walks, Yeah. run around. And yeah, you saw it run yeah. around and run around. And then it was Christmas time. And he went to see his, his kid and his grandchild. And at the end of it, his grandchild has the angel and he's able to lift his grandchild up and put her all the way up to the top of the tree. Yeah. It's like, and not a word was spoken. And it's like, oh, that's the best story I've ever heard. <laughs> So, the, so sometimes there are ways to do that that really grab hearts. The problem with that is I don't remember what product or company it was for. So if you're trying to sell me something, <laughs> too bad. Yeah. But but you got you got me at, at you know, lifting the grandkid, and you know there's all sorts of ways to do it. But you did a great job, Brian and Eric. Thank you as always for your support. All, also, uh, you know, Bridge City Entrepreneurs and Bridge City Media, wonderful company. Marianne, it's great to see you. Uh, Marilyn, great to meet you. The people who are gone, thank you. Oh, thanks. We'll keep Salam. It's nice to have you here, and we'll we'll keep doing these. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate everyone tuning in, and uh, everyone's been an awesome audience. Uh, can't ask for better opportunity. So it's been fun talking about story brand. It was a challenging subject with so many different like facets that you can take it. So uh, hopefully this will just kind of gave everyone a little bit of a dipping their toes into it, and um, you're able to use this information for uh, your own brand and your own company. So yeah, thank you so much.